Welcome everybody to the second tech talk of uh, of this year. Um, well, this, this guy really doesn't need an introduction. Everybody knows who Steve Poliak is, so I'm not going to go to the exhaustive and impressive list of all his accomplishments. Today he's going to talk about uh, the latest and I think the biggest accomplishment, Rad Dickel. Uh, Steve is certainly a free radical, so <laughs> I'm not going to drag this out too long. Without more ado, I give the floor to Steve to inform us about his life as a free radical. Thank you. Thanks, Gunter. Um, and uh, you know, thanks so much for coming to spend your time uh, at lunch with us. Really appreciate it. And everyone online too. Thanks for um, taking part in this uh, talk. Um, again, uh, you know, I, I have uh, plenty of slides, and I'm going to hopefully try to get through them all. Um, but uh, you know, if you have any questions or whatever during the talk, feel free to stop me and you know make this more of a conversation if you need to as well. So, um, so first, I'd like to start with something um, a little different. This is Science Friday. I'm Ira Plato. A bit later, we're going to be talking with former NASA astronaut Sandra Magnus about the future of the International Space Station. Uh, so hopefully everyone uh, heard that okay. Um, so one of my favorite uh, radio programs is NPR Science Friday, hosted by Ira Flato. Any Science Friday fans in there? Yes. Okay. Um, and, you know, so Ira typically has very interesting guests. Um, and one particular Friday, Ira's guest was one of our most distinguished NASA astronauts. Uh, her name is Dr. Sandra Magnus. Um, and Dr. Magnus is an engineer with degrees in physics, uh, electrical engineering, and her PhD actually is in material science and engineering. Uh, she's originally from Bellevue, Illinois, which is just outside of St. Louis. And she spent over 158 days in space. And she was appointed as the first woman to be executive director of the American Institute of Aeronautics and Astronautics. And uh, so this is a little bit of the conversation she was having with Ira. Um, and uh, all the conversation was basically around this time that she spent uh, aboard the International Space Station. You spent so many months up in the space station. Tell us what life is like that and what makes it a valuable place to be in. You know, I think, well, first of all, um, life up there is really magical. Uh so, and then she went on to talk about, um, in particular, the experience she had with something called microgravity. But just living in, in the microgravity environment the way we do gives you a whole different appreciation for it. And I think that's really the key. And in this conversation she was having with Ira, she talked about how um, there's a difference between... You know, Ira, um, there's a difference between intellectual knowledge and experiential knowledge. So again, a lot of the conversation rotated around this concept that there's a difference between intellectual knowledge and experiential knowledge. Um, and... Intellectually, you know, she knew all about microgravity, right? She had received all of the training. Um, she's a scientist. She's an engineer. Um, she knew about things like the effects of the perpetual free fall that you experience on the International Space Station. She knew about the redistribution of blood in the body and so on. Um, but she went on to talk a little bit more specifically about what she meant between the difference between intellectual and experiential knowledge. And you're approaching it from your intellectual knowledge about how the equations work and the effect of, of the force of gravity in those equations and, and in those um, phenomenon. When you live in microgravity, you understand it in a different way. So this was her point, is that when you live in microgravity, when you actually experience it, you get a much deeper appreciation for it. She talked about this experience of not being restricted to a floor uh, and discovering new freedom of motion when you can navigate in all three dimensions. And then uh, one more uh, little sound bite here. So I think getting people up there who have technical training and uh, creative sparks to, to actually internalize what that microgravity environment's all about will really expand the possibilities of what we may be doing in space. So Dr. Magnus's message, you know, as we heard, I think has a special relevance to ACT as well, um, as we interact with our own, uh, what I would consider microgravity endeavor, the learning space. Um, ACT needs to cultivate, uh, just like uh, Dr. Magnus was saying, 
both intellectual and experiential knowledge. To do that, we need capabilities that can get directly inside learning processes as they occur um, in the learning space, which brings us to the purpose of our talk today. Um, so in this talk, I'm gonna share with you our work on the Recommendations and Diagnostics API, or sometimes referred to as RAD. Um, and on November 12th of 2018, ACT sent out a press release that hopefully some of you saw for something called the Recommendations and Diagnostics or RAD engine. Uh, the press release described a new capability uh, that was developed here at ACT that can be integrated into ACT products to support learning scenarios. In particular, it described the initial integration with ACT Academy to enable more granular skill evidence tracking and more robust resource recommendations. Uh, and this was supporting our free ACT test preparation uh, offering. So uh, yes, in one way, we certainly think this was rad, and I guess sort of the 80s sense of rad, um, in being something cool, uh, new, innovative, and interesting. Um, but uh, there's another sense in which this work can be considered, uh, quote, radical. Um, because in business, uh, radical thinking is actually uh, all about getting down to the root of the situation or problem. Radical itself, the word uh, comes from the Latin radix. And in math, uh, as many of the math people in the room know, uh, radix defines the core building blocks for a numeral system. Like, for example, the 10 digits uh, for the decimal system. From these roots, uh, one can build any decimal system integer. And then in linguistics, uh, radix basically refers to a root word from which other words may be derived. So for example, from the root word nav, meaning ship, we can derive words like navel or circumnavigate. So it's in this way that I wanna talk about our radical approach today. Stressing this work as foundational, uh, providing building blocks from which further derivations can be made. And in particular, we're focused here on ACT's transformation uh, to support learning as one of the three main pillars of measurement, learning, and navigation. So some of the foundational questions for learning map onto the R and D uh, of RAD. For example, we may ask, well, what does a learner know or need help with? Um, for this, we'd like to apply some kind of diagnostic approach. We can then ask, you know, what can a learner do to address the identified need? Uh, for that, we'd like to have some type of a recommendation engine. So given these roots or foundations or building blocks, um, we can enable new derivations, things that can be uh, like, for example, learning experiences or personalized pathways to success. So in this talk, I'd like to address four main areas. Um, for the roots of RAD, I'm going to describe essentially where this idea for the work came from uh, and what was built in conjunction with many ACT teams. I'll then provide a high-level overview of what RAD currently is. And in RAD derivations, we're going to look in particular at how RAD was integrated into uh, ACT Academy. And we'll also look at other ways in which we might integrate it into other offerings as well. In RAD directions, it's an opportunity for us to look at um, both uh, new and future developments around this work. Make sense? All right, so let's start with the roots of RAD. Um, certainly, uh, many of the ACT Nexters in the room know that in January of 2017, ACT Next put together a description of a project uh, with the aim to, quote, uh, find a way to analyze results and link them directly to targeted remediation. Uh, this was a project that we called the missing link. We see in the center of this diagram essentially the original vision for both a diagnostics and recommendation engine that would work together to link assessment data and instructional resources for the learner. So this was building on the emergence of the LEAP platform at the time. Um, and that LEAP platform, as it's shown in the diagram here, contains uh, data from different uh, ACT products, for example, ACT or ACT Online Prep, Online Prep Live, or other related data. Uh, as well as also incorporating the open source resources from open ed, the open educational resources. 
And as many of you know, uh, we, built a, uh, we built on this concept to produce a prototype um, of a mobile application that was envisioned here on the right-hand side facing the learner. Uh, the ACT Next uh, educational companion app was conceived actually starting all the way back in November of 2016. Um, from these original sort of early concept vision ideas that we had and we were discussing, we sat down and worked uh, on some designs for this shortly thereafter in conjunction with Corey on the UX team. We then actually built a prototype app targeting both Apple and Android platforms for the app. Um, this included both the mobile application itself, but also all of the underlying services to support the mobile application. Um, as many of you know, the app offered test prep users a way to review personalized diagnostics um, based on their prior ACT data, but also we were blending in their work keys data and the Tessera data using a consistent three-star system and offered both instructional content and quizzes from open ed. Uh, as I'm about to talk about, the actual engagement for this was in uh, South Carolina. This was unique because it was a community that was a Carolina Alliance for Technology. I know uh, Alina is going to be talking uh, in the future at a superintendent conference about what we did tomorrow. tomorrow. OK, well, there you go. Um, and uh, what was interesting is because they were a workforce ready community, they had several students who all um, I mean, certainly, yes, took the ACT once or multiple times. They'd all also taken the work keys assessments multiple times. And they had all taken the Tessera social emotional learning assessment as well, too. So in this mobile app, we actually blended that cohort's data for all three of those products together in one experience within this mobile app. So here's a picture, for example, of Alina uh, as we flew down to South Carolina, presenting the original concept to the pilot group of 100 uh, high school uh, juniors and seniors. And then we actually sat down and worked with the local IT staff of the high school uh, to help them procure. They procured I iPads at the school, and so we actually got our prototype app directly onto the school-issued iPads. And over the subsequent uh, three months, uh, we gathered data essentially on the use of the app. And uh, all of this was leading up to the students who were going to retake um, essentially the ACT again with a voucher that we were providing to all the students. And overall, I'd say we accomplished our original pilot goal for, uh, for developing the companion app. And so our focus uh, with respect to the missing link was obviously here on the front end. We were looking at the mobile app and creating the learner experience for uh, these learners. But uh, we sort of turned our attention next to making this back end into a more reusable uh, ACT service or an API that could offer recommendations and diagnostics capabilities to any front end or product, uh, whether it's a mobile app, a website. And that's essentially what this talk is focused on, RAD and its derivations. So again, we can think of RAD as providing a set of building blocks that are the root components for learning and assessment systems. RAD essentially enables um, a feedback-based lifecycle that iterates between actions from a learner and insights or data provided by the RAD API. It begins essentially with a learner generating evidence in some form that gets sent to RAD. That could be anything. It could be traditional item response data. It could be data from a simulation or a game. Um, we're not limited in terms of exactly what that evidence looks like that comes from learners. But RAD uses that evidence to generate the diagnostics. And then, in turn, the diagnostics are used to drive the selection of personalized resources for the learner. The learner then interacts with those resources, and it leads to the generation of more evidence of learning. So essentially, this iterative life cycle is what allows RAD to continue to learn more about what learners know and to refine and deliver the resources for them. So as many of you have seen, we've seen Martin put the slide up before, uh, working with the enterprise architecture and core learning uh, architecture team that included people like David Kuntz, John Green, Adam Bloom, Wes LaMarche, Jason Carlson, and others. Uh, we defined essentially how RAD integrates within an ACT learning architecture. Uh, if I can break this down a little bit, we can trace some of the RAD-based flows in this architecture. So, you know, obviously what I'm putting here is on one side the diagnostics and on the other side are the recommendations. And our model is essentially that any learning and assessment system can be configured down the center there uh, to create a common back end 
and send events, to send learning events, uh, just like we do today to the ACT's Learning Event Hub Leap, um, where the results of assessments can be stored in a learning record store. So RAD essentially listens to this stream of activity using inferential statistical models, in this case, the current ELO-based uh, proficiency algorithm, to essentially update what the ACT learning architecture calls a personal learner knowledge graph. This graph itself is actually configured um, based on the taxonomy that's here labeled in the upper right here, the knowledge graph, and is currently realized as the holistic framework that we use within RAD. But we're not limited to that taxonomy, right? We could use any hierarchical taxonomy. RAD essentially then generates, uh, as it's processing, snapshots of learner knowledge graphs uh, before it commits an update. So in addition to having kind of a always up-to-date, ready-to-go diagnostic report for the learner, we also have a time series of data of learner and, uh, diagnostic uh, over uh, the time that they're interacting with and providing us with results. So the personal uh, learner knowledge graph is then used by the learning environment to convey progress to the learner and to help the learner identify what areas essentially need review. Um, it's also what powers the recommendation engine that creates the personalized lists of learning resources on demand, leveraging essentially cached content that we get from ACT curators. So the core RAD team actually looked at a range of inferential algorithms and models. Um, this included um, algorithms from uh, Bayesian knowledge tracing, uh, algorithms more closely around IRT, uh, AFM, PFA, and the log linear test model, as well as ELO, and uh, work from Gunter and his team as, uh, as well. So currently, uh, RAD API has adopted an ELO-based algorithm um, inspired by the multidimensional RASH and the log linear test model. So um, many of you might not be familiar with ELO, um, but basically when a set of caliper quiz items uh, get, arrive at RAD, it currently uses this ELO-based algorithm to make adjustments to the hierarchical probability-based estimates of skill mastery. Um, the ELO algorithm, again, is um, it's a widely used uh, approach to rank players in many competitive games, typically chess is where we think about it. And you can think of it essentially as taking the result of two players where we know their prior rankings, and then based on the result, making some adjustment to the rating depending on who won. Um, so in a similar way, we can look at the skill or skills um, here and say, all right, let's say we've got Jane Smith here on the left versus a particular language arts and literacy skill. Uh, in this case, uh, scanning for and locating key details in the text. So if Jane gets the item correct, we're going to make an adjustment to strengthen her rating on the skill. Alternatively, if she misses, we're going to make an adjustment to decrease our prediction of mastery for the skill. So, um, you know, hopefully that's pretty straightforward in terms of what's happening at the skill level for the mastery um, for the student, but we're not uh, satisfied with just sort of only uh, updating mastery at the skill level. We also have to deal with the hierarchical nature of the taxonomy as well, too. So we make adjustments to skill predictions um, from these lower levels, and they essentially get propagated up the hierarchy so that we can also yield probabilistic predictions at higher levels, like those at the substrand, strand, uh, domain, or subject level as well. So this methodology, you know, I often talk about it as being supported by a, a simple four-step process, um, and uh, it has a convenient uh, ASAP, so I'll try to give this to you uh, ASAP. Um, in a line, the first part of the step um, is where we work with item authors that actually identify the skills, uh, the skill or skills from a taxonomy, like the holistic framework, essentially aligning each of the items with the areas in the uh, taxonomy. Um, these are essentially skills, obviously, that are required by the learner to be able to successfully provide a correct answer um, on the test. And at runtime, we use that lookup to identify the area of the personal learner knowledge graph that we're going to actually update. So the next step is sample. Um, so in sample, we address the question, basically, how difficult is this skill for the population as a whole? Right? As we learn from the ELO update, we're going to use a continuous assessment of learner skill mastery on one side. And on the other side, we need to determine how difficult the skill is. To do this, we gather a large sample of prior student responses to items aligned to the skill to compute an estimate of population skill difficulty. Again, we gathered all of that data for Academy 
up front before we implemented the RAD uh, approach into the platform. In assess then is actually where we go ahead and do what I just talked about, updating the learner's prior estimate skill of mastery with a new posterior estimate at the level of skill alignment um, using the current variation of the ELO algorithm that we have implemented today. And then we also, as I mentioned, propagate, all right? So we push, we have computational methods that we use to push lower level skill estimates to higher level changes, again, at like the subject or domain level. So uh, turning our attention maybe to some more applied technical considerations, um, I wanted to share with you, first of all, that there is an architecture guide available. So if any of you are more technically focused and want to look at some of our uh, implementation issues, that guide's available. And I'll, I'll briefly share some views from that artifact. So um, we can see that RAD's implemented as a set of software services uh, that are exposed in a way to make it easy to integrate RAD's capabilities into other learning and assessment systems. When we design this, you know, we use something called Swagger. Uh, if anyone's a software developer in here, uh, you might be familiar with Swagger. Uh, it's basically where we create the methods uh, that the API is used, for example, to identify new learners at runtime, or how do you submit data, or how do I retrieve calculated diagnostics and recommendations. All that effectively is designed here in Swagger. And then when we make updates in Swagger, essentially they get pushed over to the Amazon Web Services to update the actual deployment we have. So RAD API is deployed at Amazon Web Services. That's where we host it so that we can scale and manage it for any uh, application that we need. And that push essentially from Swagger goes first of all to API Gateway. Um, API Gateway, uh, if you're not familiar with these things, it's basically that part is responsible for all of the authentication and the routing and flow of service requests. So making sure just the people that we're integrating with RAD uh, can get their calls through and make that work. And in Lambda, which is the second piece that we see there, that's essentially where we implement all the business logic to perform diagnostic and recommendations functions. So we can also see that this logic is managed using a code repository. It's using something at Atlassian called Bitbucket. And there's a little component in here called pipeline. So whenever the API developers uh, send new code up to our Bitbucket repository, Pipelines is responsible for essentially refreshing and update the business logic uh, at AWS for the RAD API. And then uh, the other thing I wanted to point out too is that DynamoDB is actually the persistence part that we use. So anything that RAD needs to be able to access or store persistent data, all that's done with a component at Amazon Web Services called DynamoDB. So RAD is a modular, automatically scalable set of microservices. Um, that are composed of things like engines, plugin algorithms, libraries, utilities, and top-level facing serverless Lambda functions. So that's essentially what the developers see as we're working on that. And we can also look at um, maybe from a data perspective what's happening with RAD. And here is kind of an abstract, high-level, what we call entity relationship diagram. Um, the dark blue boxes essentially represent um, actual tables in our DynamoDB instance, uh, whereas the light blue essentially represent abstract entities. And just some highlights I want to point out from here is we can see that, for example, a learner has one and only one diagnostic record at any time, sometimes referred to as the personal learner knowledge graph in ACT learning architecture. And that diagnostic record is composed of zero to many diagnostic entries, essentially aligned with the skills in the hierarchical taxonomy. Uh, the learner is also associated with zero to many diagnostic snapshots, as I mentioned before over time. That essentially gives us our time series of diagnostic data that we can use to look at how the diagnostics are changing for learners as they take different quizzes and assessments. We also then track what are those learning uh, assessment events that are yielding um, these uh, recorded results. And we then take at the item level for all of those uh, assessments, we actually make individual item level diagnostic predictions within RAD in terms of what we believe the probability is that a learner is going to correctly answer or not correctly answer an item. So we have all of that data available, essentially labeled data that tells us our prediction from RAD was this probabilistic value and the labeled outcome is either yes, they got it correct or no, they didn't get it correct. And so later on, I'm going to show you some of the uh, predictive accuracy metrics that we're using to look at that data today. 
We can also look at RAD essentially from uh, what's called the use case perspective. Again, software developers hopefully say yes, okay, use cases, great. Um, and what we see in a use case is that it identifies actors um, as the, it identifies actors such as the learning assessment application. So we see a academy represented here as an actor on the left. And other actors depicted represent ones that are responsible for things like uh, real-time streaming of events or batch processing of historical scores, as well as the action of human curators. Uh, some of the batch processing that we had to do initially, right, was Academy was essentially accruing assessment item evidence or learner evidence prior to uh, uh, RAD being integrated. So we had to do uh, basically a backloading of all the batch work, thanks to Josh and others, uh, and pushing all that through RAD. So we were essentially able to fast forward RAD into the current state of all the data that was being collected there. Okay, so given these foundational root components, um, as I mentioned, we can derive new learning experiences. Um, so, you know, as I presented earlier, the first, uh, I guess what I would call maybe our initial derivation was with the educational companion mobile app, um, which is kind of depicted here with a very busy looking uh, graphic or figure. But essentially all that's going on here, right, is we have the holistic framework at the base, at the bottom, and we see, um, you know, evidence on the left and learning resources on the right. So with the holistic framework, again, we're aligning all of our items uh, on the for the evidence of learning. And on the right, we're tagging all the resources that are relevant for different parts of the holistic framework. And essentially, RAD sits in the center of this picture, right, driving the feedback loop that's delivered through a mobile interface in this particular derivation of RAD. So uh, the derivation for ACT Academy is very, very similar. Uh, hopefully, many of you have been in Academy. You're already familiar with it, and you know. Um, but I think what I want to do is to show you a little bit about what that integration is like, and I'll show you some of the experience within Academy that's being powered by RAD today. So you can kind of think about RAD as being slotted into this position here within the architecture. Um, basically, data flows from ACT Academy's, uh, what we call the Tau test delivery engine, that's integrated a special version of that that emits some what we call learning analytics using a IMS global standard called Caliper here and is sending that data continuously in real time to the learning analytics platform. And again, working with the emerging technologies team, again, John Green, Josh, and Brent and others, we have configured that platform to continuously, in real time, push all of that data directly to the RAD API. So it's always listening, it's always on, and there's any activity that's happening within Academy is being pushed directly out to RAD to update diagnostic models for whoever the learner was that's logged in doing uh, practice work within the Academy. Then uh, I should also point out that RAD uses um, another IMS global standard. This is one um, was one that Adam Bloom did quite a bit of work on, and I know Novation has also done quite a bit of work with as well, which is the LTI resource search API. So this integration essentially, um, at the time implemented at OpenEd, um, allows us to be able to gather the tag content that, that uh, we use to generate the personalized lists of resources for the Academy's learner resource tab, which we're about to see as well too. So again, that's kind of how RAD fits in that picture. Um, you know, when we sat down with David Kuntz and kind of described to him what RAD is and how it works, uh, he actually gave us a term that I'm sort of borrowing here called the, oh, that's a push diagnostic model. And so we said, yeah, that's, that's ab absolutely right. It's a push diagnostic model where caliper events from Academy essentially are being pushed into leaps, um, NiFi and Kafka and streams listener components, and then they get forwarded onto RAD. Um, again, we see this initial bootstrapping process as well too that we had to do, as I mentioned before, to update RAD. So, you know, for this work, we actually created uh, three different RAD environments. Um, we have essentially, you know, the classical software development, dev, test, and prod environments uh, that we use to develop and deploy. And we also then aligned them with the ACT Academy, the staging uh, and production environments that they have, as well as the leap, dev, test, stress, and production environments. So again, all of those environments are configured today uh, and they're utilized as far as the development deployment of RAD goes. So now let's take a look a little bit more specifically at what users see in Academy. So 
You know, similar to what we provided in the companion app, users basically get a three-star breakdown of their mastery. Um, Academy presents this today at both the subject and the reporting category or domain level. So here we see within math, you know, sort of a star representation for a user. Uh, it's also interesting to note here too that users can essentially bootstrap their diagnostics without doing any um, quiz or test work within Academy today. There's this little enter your scores link at the bottom here. And if they click on that, they could take their ACT score report and go look at all of their ratio scores that they had for particular reporting category domains and enter that into Academy today. Rad listens to that. We have special APIs that just handle that. And we'll actually bootstrap diagnostic model based purely on their score report data from the pre-ACT or the ACT. Um, once though, uh, the Rad API starts to get real diagnostic information, like once we start to get number and quantity items from quizzes or geometry items, then we actually switch and start using just purely the item response data and stop using this kind of stand in place ratio data that was originally um, submitted. So in Academy, users can interact, as I mentioned, with shorter quiz. Uh, th those are quizzes that essentially are all aligned with the ACT reporting categories. So if you look at any quiz, it's like a number and quantity quiz, or it's an algebra quiz, or it's a functions quiz. And um, the, the shorter quizzes essentially are about like five to 12 items, right? Just kind of a small footprint. And there's also then full length practice tests as well too. So if a learner really wants to do all 60 items in math, they can sit down and do a full math assessment within Academy. Uh, takeaway point there is that RAD uses both uh, assessment sources to update diagnostic data. So whether the data is coming from a quiz or a test, we use it all in sort of building up and looking at the skills behind the items to build the diagnostics for the users. And again, these items are basically uh, ones that Academy uses that are either retired ACT or Compass items. That's where they come from today. And when learners navigate to the resources tab, um, they can effectively choose an area of study by going to a specific score or uh, report category. So um, in this case, you know, we see number and quantity or algebra. When that happens, essentially RAD recommendation requests evaluate the area for the specific learner and builds personalized lists of re recommendations based on the, uh, the items that are identified for need within that area. So for example, we may see here that um, something like complex number operations uh, has floated to the top for this learner's uh, number and quantity area in math. And that's maybe one of the reasons why we're seeing this particular resource in this personalized list for this learner. So a good question to ask is, hey, wait a minute. I, I thought Academy had already delivered both diagnostics and recommendations prior to integrating RAD. What's the difference between what was there before and what RAD was providing? Well. Um, so there's actually many. Uh, in terms of diagnostics, this essentially represents a switch from their earlier um, simple, what we call ratio-based ratings, to one that's much more deeply network-based uh, diagnostics. Again, if anyone went to uh, Gunter's talk, you heard all about what that means and the implications of that. Um, this provides both low-level and intermediate skill predictions for us to work with, and it provides insight into things like sampled skill difficulty, as I mentioned before, and enables a continuous uh, snapshot of diagnostic changes that we provide over time. On the recommendation side, um, we move from essentially a fixed, limited set uh, of resources to a dynamic catalog, drawing on the entire catalog, again using LTI resource search, um, that uh, also then can respect any uh, curation input too, where they might prefer a particular resource for an area over time. Um, again, I, I do think that that was a really big change for Academy um, in terms of providing more high quality both diagnostics and recommendations. So here are some statistics um, that we just pulled from last week on the integration of RAD API for anyone who's interested in the numbers. Um, so, so far we've seen around 150,000 unique Academy users through RAD today. Um, around 460,000 assessments. Those are both quizzes and full length uh, practice tests. And over 1 million um, individual item mastery predictions that I mentioned before. All of this happened since the integration in was that September, I think, when we officially started until now. So uh, the numbers are actually really good. I think Academy continues to be a well-used product as we can see from what Rad's able to track on the statistics today. 
So, uh, and actually this is a point that Ada had brought up too, is, you know, I think one of the things you said is, hey, we should kind of talk about what is it, what's required to essentially create a new RAD derivation. If you wanted to say, I want to use RAD somewhere else, well, what, what would we use to talk to people to say, well, this is what you need to integrate RAD, and I'm going to call this the RAD5, right? The RAD5 essentially is five different pieces of conversation that we have to have with anyone. So um, as we'll see here, like, and, and just to put on table an example, let's say, for example, we wanted to um, integrate the RAD API with the Tessera behavioral assessment. Um, let's maybe kind of talk about what that takes. So the first part of the RAD5 is assessment events. So as we learned, right, the key to RAD's ability to interact with or work with or provide value is by actually learning to, listening to learning analytics. So we need whatever platform is hosting the RAD integration to essentially generate their assessment events. Um, and today, we use the IMS Global Caliper standard as a way of representing assessment events or assessment item events. Um, that's the way that you know, the system can externalize the results of what's happening with the learner actions in the learning environment and passing it to us. Maybe in the future, we'll look at other standards too, like XAPI. There are other kinds of standards in space too, but right now, Caliper is the one that uh, RAD natively learns and, and knows how to process today. Part two of the RAD5 is the taxonomy that will be used to align assessment evidence and track associated instructional content or open educational resources. So for example, uh, something like Tessera, this might be using the behavioral skills from the holistic framework. Um, today, RAD API also understands another IMS global standard, one called the Competencies and Academic Standards Exchange, or CASE. Uh, so if anything, standards taxonomy is expressed in case, RAD knows how to parse and process that for ingesting those or you know, providing updates of those over time. Number three is essentially the learning object repository or LOR. Um, so in order for this to work, we need to be able to have access to the resources that we're going to recommend. Um, and as many of you know, uh, Adam Bloom also um, Vikash and others uh, have uh, done work from Novation here around this space. So uh, as we mentioned, RAD API currently understands the global LTI resource search API. So any lore that implements this, we already have automatic interoperability with RAD today. Um, but we could certainly integrate in other ways as well, too, if we need to. So number four is a diagnostic algorithm. Um, so yes, we do an ELO-based um, LLTM kind of variation today. But again, RAD's architected to plug in any kind of diagnostic algorithm. We actually have many implementations plugged in today that we use to evaluate different ones. So the key here is whatever the derivation is, we just have to agree on, well, what is the diagnostic algorithm we're going to use for your derivation? Then last but not least, five is what I just referred to as the configuration, right? So uh, examples of configuration can be, OK, learning assessment system, talk to us about how you do learner identification in your system. How do you actually provide us with unique IDs? Um, it could be other things like curation rules. So for example, RAD has methods that allow a behavioral expert, in the case of Tessera, to essentially boost or feature a particular resource on a creativity skill, as opposed to relying on the dynamic search. Um, there may even be, need to be special processing, like RAD's handling of self-reported scores, and so on. But all of that I will refer to as configuration. Okay, so in the remaining time, I'd like to just share some updates with you on our RAD directions. Um, and one uh, exciting development that we're currently working on is something that we're calling the RAD dashboard. Um, the RAD dashboard essentially is a web-facing front end that uh, to RAD that will provide product owners, administrators, um, customer support, maybe even teachers and parents eventually with uh, the ability to get insights into what RAD is doing. What is it processing today? And this could be from aggregate statistics um, on the number of assessments processed or the number of unique learners over time um, to being able to find a specific learner and then look at their and review their progress over time. Um, this already has been integrated with Cognito, by the way. Um, as some of the technology people know, Cognito is the accepted ACT solution for identity management today, and RAD Dashboard uses that for its uh, user management. And we hope to have an initial release of this ready towards the end of March. 
Uh, related to that effort too, and I mentioned this earlier in the talk, is our work on evaluating RAD itself and generating what we call RAD metrics. So we're looking at all of these individual item predictions that I mentioned before that RAD is making for the learners, and we're developing metrics to measure essentially how well it's doing and performing across various subjects. And the viewing of this data may eventually not only be part of a, re a research report, but might be part of the RAD dashboard as well too, so you can go in and look at performance over time for different areas. Um, and as we focus on individual learners in the dashboard, we're hoping to build interactive visualizations of learner diagnostics over time, which we're referring to as RAD replays. Um, here, for example, is a radar chart where we have essentially individual quizzes taken in Academy represented as tick marks on the bottom of this slider. So what someone could do is once they've looked at the learner, they've found their chart here, they can essentially slide back and forward the quizzes that have been taken by that learner and look to see what the effect is on their diagnostics over time. Obviously, as you move farther out in the circle, it represents more mastery for that particular area. Um, so essentially, you can measure and kind of look through uh, interactively the progress of the learner over time. So we have written uh, several papers on this work, um, and we've submitted them for peer review and publication. Um, at play, and as well as at conference workshops too, like the upcoming LAK conference too, uh, is one of the workshop papers you'll see is a RAD API paper there. Um, and I should also mention too that this work is still connected too to our patent application that we originally filed back in November of 2017. Uh, in terms of more directions, so we continue to work with the learning architecture team in open ed on some potential changes to the use of Caliper, some ideas we have about maybe trying to make it a little bit less batchy and a little bit more continuous, um, but that's a, a conversation in progress. We're also in discussion with Krista Mattern and her team on uh, supporting the work that they're doing to measure efficacy in ACT Academy, trying to determine how we can utilize RAD in that uh, conversation. Uh, also, as part of our collaboration with Smart Sparrow, um, we're in discussions with how to use the RAD API to drive a what Drawer is calling a powered by ACT strategy. Um, as part of that work on uh, the Smart Sparrow effort, uh, we also are doing some work at looking at what we call support for multi tenancy. Multi tenancy is sort of um, a couple of changes that we need to make to uh, make it clear that. This is Academy uh, work that RAD's currently doing. This is Smart Sparrow work that it's doing. So just that we have separation between the learners and the data and the recommendations that are being made all within the single instance of RAD today. Um, and then we've just begun work with Tracy Drew, as some of you might know, to develop essentially a business model for offering the RAD API to other learning assessment systems. So things like licensing or packaging or software as a service to other um, potential customers. Uh, we're also looking forward to the future work with um, the new ACT Learning Resources team, formerly Innovation. It's going to be exciting to see how RAD can leverage the Innovation resources in addition to what we've leveraged with the Open Ed catalog so far. So, quick RAD review. Um, let's just review what I presented today. Um, we started first with the story about microgravity and essentially the difference between, yes, we need intellectual understanding, but we also need systems and capabilities that provide us with experiential uh, knowledge uh, that gives us in motivation to uh, understand how learning is working. In the Roots of RAD, we talked about our initial missing link project and our direct observations that we've done using Educational Companion mobile app. As we, re we, we reviewed RAD, we also discussed an iterative RAD lifecycle between the learner actions and RAD assistance. Um, I also presented the align sample assess propagate process that we've implemented as part of that. In RAD derivations, basically we shared our work uh, with ACT Academy and also presented what I was calling the RAD five, uh, the five things that we should talk about when we're trying to integrate with any learning assessment system. Uh, and then lastly, in RAD directions, um, we talked about several areas of focus uh, from the emerging RAD dashboard to potential work around a new RAD-based business model. So again, the takeaway message is that RAD can be used to monitor evidence of learning uh, in real time. It diagnoses those areas needed, um, needing review as mastery predictions, and it provides personalized recommendations just in time for learners. 
And if I was to think about like three words for rad, essentially they'd be available, extensible, and universal. Uh, by that we mean that it's a robust service that elastically scales using all of what we have at Amazon Web Services. Um, it's modular, as we said before, um, allowing us to plug in different types of algorithms or approaches, different lores, different assessment events, taxonomies, um, and it can take on various diagnostic implementations. And it can be applied to a range of subjects and systems too, making it universal. So I'd like to quickly thank uh, several people that have made this work possible, um, starting with ACT leadership. Alina has had the driving leadership for this and the vision for the work since really when she established ACT Next. Um, and the support from leaders like Martin and Susanna uh, have really made its development and integration with ACT, ACT Academy a reality. Um, I'd also like to thank the RAD core team that consists of Kurt Peterschmidt, um, Michael Yudelson, Benjamin Djanovich, Praveen Chopad, and project support from Toby Drake as well too. So, all of those people were sort of the core people who built what RAD is today and did all the work. I'm just the one standing up here <laughs> providing the slides. Um, and uh, I also especially want to thank our newly established research innovation development team. This is the new team that I'm leading, um, which is taking the development of RAD going forward. Again, this includes Kurt and a couple of our newly hired uh, resources, uh, Shri Darapali, what is it, Shri? There's Shri. And Bryce Paris as well too in the back of the room. Uh, these guys are the ones that are sort of taking on the new uh, directions that I was talking about in RAD. Um, we've also received a lot of support from other Nexters throughout this whole process, including Ada and Andrew, Matt, and our interns like Ethan and uh, Jenna. Most of this work though, actually the heavy lifting of all this work was really done from Sarah and Donna's assessment team. Uh, and this included people like Ryan O'Connor, Tim Burden, uh, Jay and Brian, Colin and Kim, um, David and Melanie, and again, project support from Todd Nielsen. From Academy side, you know, we'd also like to thank Polina and Mary Michael for all of the work they did, and uh, people like Jane and Max, who did a lot of work uh, as RAD was getting ready and integrated into ACT, and also the team at Cumbia, including Lacidus and Javier. Uh, from Emerging Tech, again, John Green and his team, the work from Josh and Brent was critical in making all of this work, and they did a great job. Uh, the collaboration with OpenEd was with Adam, uh, Lars, and Lucas, Yevgeny, and I also wanted to thank the former OpenEd leader who's now leading the Open Salt platform, uh, Brandon Dorman, as well, too, for his work there. From Enterprise Architecture and the Learning Architecture team, we also had all of the contributions from Wes, uh, Jason Carlson, Kirk Cribble, Jay Venega, uh, actually helped create all of our integration for the Swagger API. Uh, VJ, Julie Hastings, and David Kuntz, they were all involved as well too. So thanks to all of you for coming to learn about the RAD API. And uh, I think we've got at least time for 10 minutes yet of questions. Yeah. So we have a lot of questions online. Uh, first, we'll take the questions from audience here. So, uh, so, so the data comes in through Tau and into uh, Leap. As far and you are listening, you know, in real time, right? Mm -hmm. The item responses. What? How does the scoring occur? Like, you know, in terms of the the smaller quizzes or even the you know, that, that full end test that we are talking about, how does that happen in real time? And yeah. how do you interact? Yeah, uh, so that's a good question. Um, Caliper itself um, has a definition of what are, what is an assessment event, what's an assessment item event, what's a grading event. All of those events can be composed and authored by the learning assessment system themselves. They can decide, so typically, you know, the scoring, like, whether it depends on what we mean right by scoring. It could mean the correct incorrect scoring. It could mean you know overall scoring at the end of the test or whatever. Mostly what RAD is focusing on today is the dichotomous result from the assessment items. And that scoring actually happens by the test delivery engine. So Tau knows whatever the rubric is to score that item. And then when it's actually sending us the assessment item event, it's already a scored event that's coming to us through the uh, telemetry of the data. And then is the vision that at some point in the future this would be available 
for consumption relative to external consumers? Or it's just, you know, you're going to offer as a service, like software as a service, and sell the service in order to, you know, bring in revenue? What's the idea? What's the vision? Yeah, so um, that's where Tracy Drew kind of comes in right now, is we're thinking about how to leverage the Red API as a full-on software as a service offering. So if you have a learning and assessment system uh, and you want to use it and leverage it in your um, uh, so, so you get back all of the benefits we talked about, these probabilistic skill mastery estimates, the personalized list of resources. Um, we're looking to see how we could create this as a service and package it up um, and make it available for people who might want to buy licenses for that. But that's part of the conversation we're going to have about how we're going to move with this going forward. But absolutely, right now it's being integrated as an internal capability to support AC2 products and services. But in the future, we definitely vision that it's going to be an externalized service. Yeah. One last question. How many microservices did you build as part of this larger service? Um, there probably are, I'm guessing, about 25, 30 um, individual um, elements that are all the micro kind of uh, touch points. Um, Thank you. So uh, if, you're, if you're interested, you can look at Swagger, too, and see what are all the definition of those, too. So. Any other questions? See, there's quite a bit of chat going on too in there. I don't know if that's yeah, all this. Uh, uh, ah, all right, there we go. I noticed uh, that there were a whole lot more predictions than there were assessment events. How does that work? Um, well, there's a, uh, assessment events um, can represent many things. Um, an assessment event could be um, a, a 12 item quiz, or an assessment event could be a full 60 um, math item. The other thing, too, is to understand that we are actually unwinding uh, items that have multiple skills. So like language arts and literacy might actually have four skills uh, independently on an item. So we're looking at predictions combining all of those skills, and we're looking at the individual skills as well, too. So some of it has to do with just understanding how the um, assessment events lead to many uh, assessment item events, and those assessment item events yield multiple skill predictions or abilities for each of the learner item instance pairings as well, too. So um, does that make sense? Good answer. Yeah. <laughs> Any other questions in the room? So there are the questions, but I want to thank. Uh, Sure. Rad's computer probabilistic values, zero through one effectively, but yet we see stars in Academy. So how or where is that translation happening? So. Great question. <laughs> Kirk? Wasn't teed up at all. So. Yes. Yeah, so. <laughs> um, no, that's actually a really important point, too. So um, what, while you do see star ratings in Academy today, it's important to understand that um, all Rad is committing to is essentially probabilistic value estimates on the skill taxonomy for the learners. We're not actually specifying to any system what their star system should be or what they should do with that value. So it's actually Academy that's providing the cut scores to determine where the stars fall and uh, go as they may, too. Again, that allows systems to do a little bit more um, fine tuning on their side in terms of what they want to do with the output from their ad API, how they want to actually present that to their learners. So great question. Uh, a question from online. Uh, how does RAD handle predicting difficulty based on English, in, uh, ELA, English language arts skill? The same skills are tested at different grades. Uh, yeah, well, in terms of um, the grade variability, um, we don't do anything with the demographics. So we're not looking at what grade a learner is or what they aren't. To us, everyone is essentially one population. Um, and in in terms of how we're actually measuring it, learning analytics, um, I'm sorry, uh, language arts and literacy uh, items are, are pretty much the same to us as a science item or a math item as far as um, is it, did they get it dichotomously correct or incorrect? And what were the uh, required skills below or beneath that item today too? So 
we don't do anything to try to um, change the way that those predictions are happening with grades today. Um, now, going forward, that could be a very important thing for us to consider, too. Um, so, uh, Excuse me. What about text complexity? Again, text complexity would be something built into the, uh, what the item author is putting in. Now, as I did mention, though, we actually do sample um, all of our items where we look at, you know, we're looking at millions of um, uh, responses, essentially, uh, that we gathered from Academy. Um, and so it could lead to thousands of items, item responses for the population that's currently taking that today. So to some extent, text complexity is wrapped up into the complexity of the overall item. Um, we're not personally doing anything where we pull apart the item and try to look at text complexity item difficulty as an individual component of that, but we are certainly factoring that in. Red five, uh, you mentioned one of the things was that uh, you know you got to have content which is tagged or annotated with a particular taxonomy. So suppose you know there's a third party that wants to use Red capabilities, and the kind of content area they're talking about is not tagged with say a taxonomy that we use currently. So uh, does Red have sort of capabilities to help in that regard to say hey you know you can bring in sort of your own content area, and we can devise a way to sort of create a, a bridge or a mapping between your content area and the kind of taxonomies that we use so that integration could be a bit more you know, manageable. Yeah, I, I love the idea of having like a toolkit. Um, and I think actually as we sit down with Tracy Drew and uh, talk about the business model, it will be, that's where we're gonna have these conversations about, you know, in order to do something where you go try to sell it to another person, you really do need some of these constituent toolbox things to sit down with a customer to say, let us help you take your lore and the selected taxonomy and help you do that alignment. Um, I can imagine that it's like another thing that we want to build, another set of capabilities that are like our little toolbox that we walk into the organization and say, hey, we can help you. Um, and as many of you know, um, alignment of skill to resources and items actually happens to be things that are happening both here at ACT Next, but are also things too that are offered um, at Open Ed too. They do a lot of machine learning uh, work there too. So I think between those groups, and I'm sure we talked to Innovation too to see how they solve some of those problems, we could put together a nice little um, uh, sort of toolkit to address that um, potential question. Any more questions? So, I want to take. Oh, that was Saad, by the way, who asked that question, Brandon. Anonymous. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> so, I want to take this opportunity uh, to thank uh, today's uh, speaker, Dr. Stu Poliak, for a very powerful and magnificent talk and uh, Dr. Gunter Maris uh, for introducing uh, today's talk, Andrew and his team for uh, supporting um, this uh, talk and making it very easy. Uh, as uh, this platform brings the new development going at ACT, so in uh, next series on March uh, 14, 2019, we'll have uh, Lars Burgess, he is a lead software engineer in uh, ACT Enterprise Architecture, and he will uh, present his uh, talk on uh, Minerva. So you already uh, saw number of uh, blocks which just you mentioned that is part of the ACT Academy. So uh, we look forward your presence uh, for the next talk. And again, uh, thanks to all audience as well as uh, the audience uh, online. So thank you very much.